I'm just going to pass them out, I think. All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome to panel C6. This is an invited panel called Meme, Medium, and Mode. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about where these panelists come from in a, in a moment. But we have Jason Epping, Kate Bordeaux, then Nick Douglas will speak, then Christina Hsu. Uh, we'll be in conversation with Blaine Nooney, um, and then we'll, we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, I'll be hashtag moderating. I'm Laura portwood Stacer, so you'll see me on there, and I'll be tweeting their handles uh, as they speak. And I'll turn it over to Lane. Hey, I'm Lane, uh, Lane Nooney, and so this, uh, the panel that we were fortunate enough to be able to get, uh, to get organized uh, is based around a recent issue that Laura and I co-edited of the Journal of Visual Culture on Internet News. Uh, we began work on this in 2012, <laughs> um, and I still would like to think it's, it's, it's still fresh. Um, we have only a selection of the authors that are uh, in this issue up here today. Uh, there's a few more of you in the crowd. Shout outs to Patrick and Han. Um, and yeah, that's, oh yeah, and the whole thing is like uh, freely available online. We should tweet the link out, but uh, we were able to actually get kind of like a special dispensation from our publisher, which usually only ever wants to make money to allow this particular issue to have no, no paywall, which was kind of like a miracle from on high. I don't really know why they agreed to it, but it's pretty fantastic. So all of this is forever in perpetuity available to you. Okay, hey, um, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. Um, so, um, uh, what, what I ended up um, making for this thing was um, uh, pretty uh, impenetrable, I think, for a uh, uh, um, presentation. Uh, and I didn't think it was really appropriate to try to uh, read this uh, or, uh, <laughs> uh, or present it in that sort of way. Um, so I'm going to sort of dive into one uh, element of it that, uh, after having been here yesterday, I was very inspired to uh, talk about more, I think, because I, I want to hear more from, from everyone else who's doing similar uh, research in this. Um, but before we go any further, you've noticed I haven't pronounced the word yet. Um, uh, and when, I have to do this every time I talk about this. Um, who, by a show of hands, who uh, pronounces uh, the acronym of Graphics Interchange Format with a hard G as GIF? Okay, who pronounces it as GIF? That's actually, that's, that's really rare. I, and most of these sorts of sort of academic or um, these sorts of circles, I usually end up being 50-50. Um, so that's very interesting. Uh, I say GIF, that's what I grew up saying. Um, we all know what we mean when we say the other word or the other pronunciation. <laughs> so, um, so I think that we can, we're, on, we're all friends here and we don't need to sort of have this turf war. But um, I will let... Um, the creator of it. Instead of speaking as five words tonight, Steve is using his own invention uh, to accept his award. And Steve Wilhite, the uh, inventor of the GIF. The GIF. <laughs> so, anyway, and, and to sort of just finish this thought, um, about two thirds do say GIF and one third says GIF. But, um, like I said, uh, doesn't matter. So, um, uh, so um, part, part of this, or sort of the, um, one of the important parts of, of what uh, I, I wrote, the, the brief history of the gift so far, was, was really sort of defining what that is. And I, I think that a lot of the arguments uh, that we have about um, gifts comes down to uh, what we define them as. And uh, for our, our intense purposes, um, here are some characteristics of the gift. Uh, it's short, it's silent, it's looping, it's untitled, it's largely anonymous, um, usually seen on personal screens, uh, usually surrounded by other media, uh, and shared. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of interesting um, 
attention paid to the GIF um, sort of uh, for its aesthetic qualities. Uh, I think there's been so many narratives that we see over and over about the GIF is art now. Um, and that's interesting, certainly. Um, but I'm a little more interested in GIF as language. Um, and so um, a few years ago, in 2011, uh, I started seeing uh, a lot of animated GIFs being used in, uh, in bulletin boards and comment threads um, uh, in, in other websites um, that were being used in lieu of text um, to respond to something that was, that was happening online. This is probably one of the most common. Is, who's familiar with this, with this GIF? Right. Um, and this is another one that I uh, am very familiar with. Yeah, so, so what does that mean, right? You see that when um, you're uh, probably in a, like on Reddit and uh, a fight is about to break out or there's some sort of competing uh, knowledge or, or information uh, and someone is just saying, this is going to get good. This is interesting. <laughs> so um, I, I was just reading, I was, I was, just, I was reading Reddit for research and, uh, <laughs> and um, came up with, and these, these are called reaction gifts. Uh, and I came up with two um, categories of reaction gifts. Um, the first one I call hypothetical, uh, and these are when someone proposes a hypothetical situation and then performs a gift that sort of satisfies uh, the situation. So this is just from today from uh, the um, seminal uh, reaction gift uh, Tumblr, uh, what, sh what, should we call we, what should we call me? Um, and uh, I think it's a great example of a hypothetical reaction GIF. Uh, and then there's uh, what I call the actual reaction GIF, and this is often sort of comment threads or an email. It's, it's a little hard to read this, but um, someone is arguing about how GIF is pronounced, uh, saying GIF is pronounced GIF, and then someone's responding with the Oprah deal with it, and then the person responds below that with this angry panda. So in this instance, um, uh, these reaction GIFs are actually uh, being performed in the, in this dialogue itself. So um, I just sort of stewed, stewed over this for a long time, trying to think like what what is how does the reaction get sort of functioning uh, in the way that we're um, uh, uh, having dialogues online. Uh, and here's where I ended up. For most of for most of our species existence, um, our uh, communication has been in person uh, until the advent of of um, text until until the printing press basically uh, almost all of our communication has been in person and as a result we've sort of come up we've had these tools that we can use um, to communicate uh, and only recently have we um, uh, has most of our sort of communication been filtered through uh, computers computer mediated communication is a whole field of, of study um, and so I wanted to sort of map um, the tools that we have uh, in person to sort of the tools that we uh, have when we're using computers. Um, so linguistics sort of uh, breaks down into three major categories in the way that we communicate in person, and that's speech, uh, prosody, which includes volume, intonation, and rhythm, and then gesture. So um, what happens when we uh, map this to our computers? Okay, so text is pretty similar to speech in the way that we communicate um, in person. Um, the way we treat text is maybe similar to prosody. Maybe it would be the font or the punctuation or the capitalization is an analog to how we intone our speech or how we sort of uh, change our rhythms. But, but where's gesture? Where's gesture? Where's gesture? I, I, I was trying to find a really, I was trying to find that, where that was. And so my, my sort of, what I was positing then is maybe the reaction gif is our solution to that to start filling that in. Um, um, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a <laughs> I'm a curator at Museum of the Moving Image. I'm the curator of digital media. And so it affords me a lot of opportunities to do things like this, which in this case is to uh, ask Reddit if they want to help me curate uh, an exhibit. Uh, and so a little over a year ago, I posted this on Reddit, uh, saying, hey, um, I want to sort of collectively define a canon of reaction gifts. Um, so going back to sort of hypothetical actual uh, reaction gifts, I, I, think I think hypothetical reaction gifts are really interesting too, but I figured the best way to sort of tell this story to a general audience was to try to figure out which 
uh, where the sort of most commonly used uh, reaction goes. Um, and where better to go than, than to Reddit, uh, one of the epicenters of reaction get used. Um, so this posted this, uh, got uh, more than 100 responses, and um, one of the questions, one of the things I asked was, besides sort of posting the GIF, also uh, translate it for me. What, what does it mean when you use it? Um, and you know, try to try to like describe it to your grandma in in, in those terms. Um, so you'll probably notice, you'll probably recognize a lot of these. Um, that weird woodsman was the n name of the user. Uh, describes this as sincere pride or support, no gimmick. No attention-grabbing joker attitude, just you done good. <laughs> um, Mike Petrov uh, describes Liz Lemon giving yourself a high five as a trivial expression of congratulations, usually sent when no one else appreciates the joke or post. Um, <laughs> Meow2 uh, says Homer disappearing into the shrubs. It means the poster wants to distance themselves from what's going on, either because a fight has broken out or because things got weird and uncomfortable. Um, and this is one of my favorites, because it's so long. Um, I value your argument and want to agree with you, but I'm not prepared for the consequences of doing so, or when having to choose between doing something morally good or right and doing something you want to do. <laughs> and, and I think sort of the concision of the image compared to that lengthy explanation uh, really sums up why reaction GIF um, is a thing, like why, why it's a, a popular uh, thing because it's so concise. It's a really concise way to express something nuanced um, that we would, in, 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 if we're in the same room, would express with a gesture, I think. Um, and of course, it's also you know, very simple, um, <laughs> also concise ways to say that, but, I, but you know, <laughs> that, that's, still, that's still saying, you know, no, but it's saying what's much more than no, right? There's, there's a real um, nuance to that. Um, so um, uh, so uh, we exhibited about 30, uh, I think 37 of these in the museum. Um, and um, yeah, and it, it was it went really well. So uh, that's all I want to talk about today, but we can talk more about reaction gifts later. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. Charles Barrett and I set out to study this typeface um, and also to explore why it is that impact became the meme font. And there are uh, technical reasons for this and there are design reasons for this that I'll get into. But as we started looking at this typeface, we also uh, saw within it this dialogue between standardization and variability, um, or between constraints and creativity that we think are really important not only in understanding um, this typeface and typography in general, but also in understanding internet memes uh, and image uh, macros in particular. Um, so, Impact was designed in 1965 by a British type designer by the name of Jeffrey Lee. It was designed for the Students in Blake Type Foundry. Um, and it was designed as a metal typeface at a time when the print industry was moving away from metal into photo typesetting and digital typesetting um, technologies. Um, Aesthetically, it is right in time with its period. Uh, impact is one of at least seven bold, condensed, sans serif typefaces that are designed between 1954 and 1967. Um, this is just a, a smattering of them to show you the similarities and the, the differences that exist. Um, 
these typefaces seem to be exaggerated versions of really popular um, uh, Swiss modernist typefaces that were designed in the 1950s. Uh, Swiss modernism, for those who don't know, is a design movement that comes after World War II um, that's very much about creating harmony and order and balance um, in the designs and sort of by extension doing this within society. Um, and so in the designs, they're creating order and balance um, through, in large part, the use of sans serif typefaces and the use of grids. Um, there are a number, there are maybe uh, three or so major sans serif typefaces that um, uh, are used predominantly during this time period. Uh, one, accidents or tests of the late 19th century typeface, but then there are also two that are designed during this period that are used widely. Um, one is Universe by Adrian Frutiger, and then the other one is the well-known uh, uber-popular Helvetica uh, designed by Max Meininger and uh, Edward Hoffman. Um, so these typefaces sort of have that harmony and balance designed directly into them. Um, so for instance, Helvetica uh, has balance between figure and ground, between the, the dark shapes and the white shapes, um, but then also has uh, balance among the characters. The characters in the typeface are highly uniform, so the C looks very much like the E, looks very much like the O. There's a, a strong repetition of shapes within the typeface that tie it together. Um, what happens with these condensed bold sans serifs is you're basically just taking these nice Swiss sans serifs and you're squishing them horizontally. Um, and what ends up happening when you do that is you're not only exaggerating the typeface, you're also exaggerating the regularity of the typeface as well. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about that later. Um, the popular use of impact doesn't actually happen for another 30 years or so. Um, it isn't until 1992 when Microsoft includes impact in its operating system. Um, and during the, the mid-90s, uh, Microsoft's operating system is the most common one around the world. Also, Internet Explorer is the most common uh, web browser in the world at the time. And so, in large part, the popularity of impact has to do with its inclusion in the Microsoft universe. Um, this is then, uh, the, the proliferation of impact then is furthered in 1996 when it um, becomes one of the 11 core web fonts. Um, now, simply being one of the 11 core web fonts isn't quite enough to explain why impact becomes the, the meme font. Um, so, if we look at the 11 typefaces, we can begin to see some of the reasons why it might be the one that's chosen. Uh, if you think about the sort of the, um, the desired effects of phrases in image macros, uh, generally, this is not a serious statement, right? This is not a legal document. Uh, this is a punchline. It's witty. It's punchy. It's funny. Um, but then also you want to attract attention. So uh, in this list, there's basically four typefaces that stand out as ones that will attract attention to themselves. Uh, there's Arial Black, Comic Sans, Impact, and Webdings. Now, Webdings <laughs> is going to attract attention to itself, but it's illegible. <laughs> so we're not going to use Webdings. Comic Sans is going to attract attention to itself, but probably not the kind of attention that you want to attract to yourself. <laughs> um, so this leaves us with Arial Black and Impact. Both of these are typefaces that um, attract attention mostly through the sheer force of their weight. They're very heavy typefaces, very thick typefaces. Um, but for Arial Black, that's sort of that's where it ends. Uh, Arial is famously a typeface that's based on Helvetica, and one of the things that Arial borrows from Helvetica is the neutrality of this typeface. 
So Ariel Black has a lot of weight, but it doesn't have a lot of character of its own. It's just this sort of neutral receiving space. So what impact has that, that Ariel Black doesn't is character, and a lot of that character comes from that intense regularity that's created when you condense um, the Swiss sans serif into a condensed gold sans serif. Um, so you can see what ends up happening is the, the typeface just becomes this series of very uniform vertical rectangles. Uh, the typeface has really thick vertical strokes and almost no horizontal strokes. So if you look at the, the M there, um, it's basically just three vertical rectangles. Um, and it is um, in large part this regularity of rhythm that makes impact a good typeface for the production of image macros. Um, and this is in large part because image macros are created through meme generators, through a process of standardization and automation. Um, and impact with its regularity of characters is really nicely positioned for that sort of automation. Um, the, the regularity is taken even further in the typeface um, by having a really high x height. Uh, the x height, as the name suggests, is the height of the lowercase x. Um, here, it's the dotted line at the top of the R. Um, and if you look at that height as it relates to the cap height, which is at the, the top of the H, um, that's a really high x height. The ascenders, the bit of the H that goes up, and the descenders, the bit of the Y that goes down, these are also really short. So what impact does is it keeps all of its pieces really close in to the main body of the characters. Um, and what this does, particularly in light of the, the automation of creating image macros, is um, it cuts down on the number of decisions that you have to make in setting the typeface. Um, the, the closer in you keep the parts of your character to the main body of the type, the fewer decisions you have to make about the spacing between characters, the spacing between lines, and things like this. Um, if we look at uh, the uppercase, a lot of image macros simply use the uppercase of impact. Basically, each character is a uniform rectangle of color. And so this is really easy to space. You don't need to make decisions. And again, if you're automating this process of laying text over image, then this is a very useful typeface to use. Um, the automation is taken even further by setting the typeface in white. Um, oftentimes, what you'll find is that it's set in white with a black contour, which makes it even easier to just automatically stick it on any image whatsoever. You don't need to care what the, the, the color palette of your image is, um, where certain letters are positioned, things like this. Um, so even though impact is a typeface that is basically a mutation of earlier typefaces. Um, the regularity and uniformity of the typeface um, facilitates the automatic combination of a wide variety of image and text. Um, now, when, when Charles and I started thinking about this wide variety of images and phrases that exist in the world of image macros, we ask the question, um, I suppose, of each other, uh, what is actually mimetic about memes? And the answer that we came up with, as biased as this may be, uh, is impact. Right? Not every image macro uses impact, but it is this common, stable factor that runs throughout this particular kind of meme. Um, and this led us to, to two conclusions, and this is where I will conclude as well. Um, the, the first is basically that impact is using these image macros to proliferate itself, 
to ensure its longevity. Um, and then the second conclusion, I suppose related to it, is sort of in, in return for that service, what impact is offering to image macros is that stability that is so integral to mimesis itself. It produces um, this standardized foundation. It produces these constraints from which then the, the creativity of image macros is allowed to grow. Thanks. Um, so I'm very used to only communicating in terms of uh, a series of Tumblr posts, each apologizing for the last. So this will be a little sloppy, but we're going to do it. All right. Um, right. So I wrote this piece called It's Supposed to Look Like Shit, um, which is about the sort of, uh, you can imagine, and I will show you soon, the uh, sorts of internet content that, uh, that are supposed to look like shit, that are designed with some sort of intention uh, of not looking traditionally beautiful, where that's part of the actual point, um, but also a lot of images which were supposed to look as good as the creator possibly, possibly could make them, but because that creator is very amateurish or didn't have access to the right tools, uh, they end up similarly uh, looking really bad, and that becomes also something treasured by the people who uh, consume that medium. Um, so, it's sort of a catch-all thing, this is, I am not an academic, and so this is, I'm not a rapper, and so this is uh, just like a collection of things I've noticed and hoped that can get picked up uh, and, and analyzed uh, more carefully uh, by people who uh, have the skills to do so. Um, so, it's not actually like the way that all memes uh, necessarily look, but it is the dominant theme uh, of uh, meme creation. And it's also, uh, a lot of you might be familiar with the new aesthetic, which is basically, you know, you put a QR code in a forest or some shit, where like you're, <laughs> you're showing the digitized world um, in terms of, the, you know, breaking into the real world. Uh, having stuff, uh, you know, you can see all the, the, the glitch art uh, that's coming. It's about like computers taking over and trying to analyze the real world. This is kind of the opposite. This is going somewhere online and finding that uh, humanity is seeping in to places that were supposed to be fully digital. Um, and you know, there's this, still this feeling here of like something out of place, some how did I get here, I am not good at computers sort of thing, is very similar to the, the feeling of the new aesthetic of, of how is this thing invading our world? How are we in accidentally invading the world of the computers? Um, so it's, it's often very campy because, it, uh, like I said, it can be achieved accidentally uh, or uh, you know, with full intention, but you don't necessarily lose points for clearly having intentionally made something bad. Um, so I'm going to give some examples. Rage comics are pretty core internet ugly. Here you have uh, a lot of the MS Paint aesthetic. There's another excellent piece in the, this journal issue uh, about the evolution of MS Paint and how it came to be the, like, the way that you would create uh, when you had to tell some simple story or express yourself with the absolute minimum artistic uh, ability. Obviously we've come up with uh, a lot of things, especially on touch screens, that, uh, or even if you, it turns out, Google the word draw, the first result is a great uh, sort of app that sort of slicks up your lines, automatically adds some smoothness, makes it feel painted. Uh, I don't like that, I like this. Uh, that, that, this is celebrating something because it's still being done in an era when people have access to better tools. This is still the easiest way to just, just be like, I'm getting my thing out there, and whatever I enter in, no matter how poorly done, like on a mouse, which is not made for drawing, it's still going to be exactly what my uh, motions were, what my expression was. It's not going to smooth it out into something I didn't intend. Um, a lot of these, by the way, will include, you'll notice in a lot of Rage comics, little notes saying, oh, I actually was this umbrella one, uh, why am I pointing at that? This umbrella one up uh, there uh, has a note somewhere and it's like, I actually was holding the umbrella this way uh, just to say that like, oh, this isn't clip art that was already angled. People have to apologize for the way that they, uh, that their comic looks nothing like real life. 
Um, so uh, you might be familiar with these Rage comic uh, template makers, which uh, a lot of the time templates have a way of taking away the feeling of internet ugly. Uh, Impact is a meme font, um, but it, there are a lot of advice animals uh, and, and uh, image macros floating around, especially from early on. They had a lot of different fonts back when people had to make them themselves uh, before the templates. But in the case of Rage comics, the templates haven't really uh, eliminated the ugliness. It's kind of baked in into those faces. Uh, people can add their own, but the, the prime faces are usually just as sloppy as possible. Um, this is one of my favorites, and uh, it gets down to like, one of the really little details that I appreciate is, so this is of course like, you know, the, the rage of a waiter not bringing you your food when you thought that place would be you. Um, and a lot of these, of course, are, are used for expressing very relatable stories that everyone can, uh, well, relate to. And that's why, uh, you know, that's why they proliferate so much, that's why they're using some very basic tools, because everyone has one of these shitty little stories to tell. And what I really like to write here is that this dish is not cropped. They're clearly an eraser tool. They could have erased the area around this, and I like to believe. Um, I'm scared to ask the person who made it, although I have found them on Reddit, um, whether or not they really made a decision not to erase that, because I'm not sure which I like more. On the one hand, if they didn't make the decision, it's just a celebration of how when you have something to get out there, uh, the internet is a place where you can, most of the internet is a place where you can take it and not even fucking bother with the details. Just like get the basic symbols out there. Um, and on the other hand, if they made the decision to keep it and thought, oh, that looks funny, or probably, I'm guessing it was somewhere in between, of glancing before they published and seeing like, oh, I'm not gonna remove the white space around there, uh, is a little bit of like the, the opposite of Trump loyal. It's like, like some postmodern commentary on, hey, look at how this image isn't really a representation of reality, as if you needed to know. <laughs> So, um, oh, I also just would love for you to notice on the final panel that the fa face is, um, has a lot of artifacts from, from being resized and compressed several times. The color red, I think, uh, mostly doesn't appear that much on the internet because, you know, that the most sites other than like Netflix, major sites shy away from it because it, it's just sh really shitty at compressing. I don't know what it is. Uh, but I really love when memes can clearly contain elements uh, that have been highly degraded um, from their previous copies. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a way that the, that the chase toward doing something wrong can metastasize. Um, you know, the, the famous troll face is here done by several different artists in several different ways, and the only joke they seem to be making is, ha ha ha, this isn't really what the troll face looks like. Ha ha ha, I'm doing it wrong. And so I think definitely that the aesthetic of it is specifically tied to the message. Um, Snapchat is, uh, you know, has, has I think actually brought a bit of a rebirth uh, of internet ugly. I was worried for a while that a lot of these things like Rage Comics are not very popular anymore. Um, and I thought that, oh, our tools are getting slicker. It's getting harder to find something that's ugly. Um, it's not true. Snapchat has brought back the MS Paint aesthetic. Um, and in the middle, um, there's also the nailed it uh, motif, I think, which is someone imitating, someone claiming and, and, and posturing uh, with a lot of braggadocio um, and very obviously uh, reveling in the fact that they have not earned it. Um, also, note the brainwreck.com watermark. I'll get back to that later. That is also a form of image rot that I would say uh, falls under Internet Ugly. Um, the shitty network on Reddit. Uh, Reddit is... Anyone not familiar with how Reddit works and subreddits? Cool. So the shitty network is a network of subreddits mocking other subreddits or parodying or saying, haha, we could never achieve the great things in those other subreddits. So um, there's, you know, there's also the uh, safe for work porn network, which has stuff like earth porn, which looks like beautiful stuff that you would make your desktop. Well, of course, there's shitty earth porn, uh, which has, I'm first going to read the title of this image, which is beautiful sunset outside my door this morning. Ready? <laughs> and I just, I just think this is the purest fucking comedy in the world. Is that feeling of uh, someone was talking about cringe comedy um, in the last session? I think there's a, that's part of the enjoyment here. Is this is someone where the creator is presenting themselves as the joke, um, and I think that's very satisfying. Um, 
so there's a, you know, Reddit has just thousands of users all trying to outdo each other with this same basic joke of, here's this great thing I made, oh, it's not actually great. And in the shitty wallpaper subreddit, um, uh, there's this image, well, there's this whole gallery that I wanna, oh, I have it here. I wanna show you this uh, caption first for the gallery. You know, the usual stuff that you would actually see in um, a slicker uh, gallery of wallpapers, like, you know, I can, I can take requests, no, I don't do this for money, you know. And uh, this is their wallpaper. <laughs> that white space is part of the original. Um, I really like the choice of Shaun of the Dead's uh, black. Uh, and that, of course, it's not a photo from Shaun of the Dead. It's just the actor. Uh, I can, you know, this is, this is what I do for fun. It's sit and, and pick apart every uh, detail that's wrong in something. Uh, so I'll just run through just like a bunch of other things that are examples of internet ugly. There's uh, YouTube, poop, uh, weird Twitter, I would argue, but I'm really going out on a limb there. Uh, Doge, of course, or Doge, um, starts with the, you know, obviously the, the use of Comic Sans on purpose, uh, not lining up anything along a grid. Uh, Bazinga, which there are only a few of, but this is a, a series of parodies of the Big Bang Theory in which Sheldon is increasingly this like mystical troll figure. You'll notice his head going a lot like this, like very similar to the troll wavy arms. The feeling of like, I am everywhere. Uh, sort of jestery thing. Uh, Dolan, which is a, a particularly creepy series of MS Paint uh, drawings, real gross out shit. Um, and more of the, the nailed it sort of aesthetic, which uh, might just take things from the real world, but really sets them up as, here's the thing that like is almost fictional. Like it almost, it almost makes it look like that those two top images don't really exist. Because in the real world, here's how everything looks. So I think Internet Ugly has a real uh, sensibility of like, oh, here in the real world, we fail. And that's okay. That's normal. It's not normal to make a correct minion cake. That's <laughs> fucking weird. Um, so I want to talk about a few other articles that I've read that I think have done uh, what I tried to do better. And one of them is Adrian P Chen on uh, Troll Punk. This is just a very short piece where he uh, presented Troll Punk as uh, anything that, that, that is around trolling on the internet. Examples being like anonymous uh, and doxing. Um, and Weird Twitter again, um, very much like, like Internet Ugly, it's sort of like putting on a show. Um, but Troll Punk is a little more about a target. Um, there's usually someone who loses in Troll Punk, even if they're theoretical, um, and it's not necessarily the speaker, usually it's not the, uh, the creator. Um, I think Internet Ugly does not only uh, fall under that, um, but uh, definitely Troll Punk is worth uh, more exploration. Um, Gawker's Sam Biddle um, made this for a piece about Chart Brute, which is, I'm really jealous of that. Um, Chart Root is the, the you know, conspiracy theorist aesthetic that's also very MS Paint-y. Um, you'll get a lot of like red rectangles around things. You see a lot of um, different screen caps of several forums all jammed together in a big mess uh, until it's, it's very unreadable. Um, and again, it, it, you know, the, the, the format shows a lot about the people who create it. So of course it's very popular among uh, gamer gators, uh, fans of the fappening, uh, and just people who are, are trying to uh, you know, draw everything under their control um, and try to get a grasp on it because they think that everything is a giant conspiracy. I mean, you can just like see, and this is obviously uh, Adrian's parody of it, but you can see that, like, how that crazed mentality comes through in the feeling there. Um, and finally, I want to show uh, Brian Feldman's uh, article on the All about the ship pick. Um, in the triumphant rise of the ship pick, he talks here about this is. Um, a uh, meme that appeared originally on, uh, you can read it up there, but uh, Black Girl Problems underscore official on Instagram. Um, and over here is Ludic version Ludicrous put on his Instagram. And you'll notice that just tons of shit has happened to this. Um, and Feldman pointed a lot of it out how um, not only is there you know, the regram label, the, um, it's very hard to see up here, but there's a, a huge decrease in quality of the image. Um, it's just been processed so many times. Uh, under the rebrand label, the uh, official or the original watermark of Black Hole Problems official has been uh, just like 
degraded past recognition. Uh, and then finally, uh, oh, also the cropping you'll see as people were clearly screen capping, doing none of the things you're clearly you're quote unquote supposed to do when you um, copy an image. Uh, they found all these ways that they were slightly easier or the only thing they could do when they were in an app that wouldn't let you save an image uh, manually. Um, all these things that you're theoretically not supposed to do uh, so that they could translate something into another site or make it their own. Um, and lastly, the, the Instagram grid, which I think is a real feat because to do that, you have to not just screen cap your consumption of it, you have to screen cap your own uploading process and somehow re-upload that into it. <laughs> like, I honestly don't understand how that is unintentionally done. Uh, I would really like to believe that uh, Ludacris was sort of making a very clever uh, comment and saying, ha ha ha, what if I did this, guys? Um, uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is that uh, Feldman actually noticed that the ship pick aesthetic, he says, could be the first non-numeric indicator of viral dissemination. And I really like that because it means uh, the more an idea has succeeded, the more and more it is going to look like shit. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought I would begin by saying that uh, I think I can very factually state that this issue would not exist without RaffleCon. Uh, it just, like, none of this reality would be happening in this room if RaffleCon had never happened. Um, and part of the, the sort of weird history of the journal, um, or how the issue intersects with RaffleCon, is that in late 2011, early 2012, I was a very bored graduate student watching Too Much Friday Night Lights, and I started making a meme called Academic Coach Taylor. And I don't know, maybe anyone's ever heard of this? Yeah, and it got like weirdly popular. It, the moment when it got into the back of, like, on the New York Magazine approval matrix, I was suddenly like, I'm an internet person. And then I saw, I heard about this like conference for internet celebrities, and I was like, well, I should be at this, right? And so I just like bought a bus ticket. I was like, I'm going to Cambridge, Massachusetts, okay. Um, and that was where I suddenly saw the culture of, like, of, or one form of the culture of one of the many internets, yeah, sort of manifest itself to me. Um, it's where I met Nick Douglas, it's where I first saw Patrick Davison speak and Anne Mina and Jonathan Zutrain. Many of the people who wound up in this issue kind of went through your circuit first. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could give kind of that apocryphal story a little bit of kind of that beginning of RaffleCon, right? And, uh, you know, just summarize a bit, maybe for those of you who are less familiar with uh, the event and kind of why it is, I think, kind of a historic property in the history of internet culture. Sure. So um, RaffleCon was started by a few friends, uh, Tim Huang in particular, and Diana Kimball and I, um, back in 2000, late 2007, really. And it, it literally started as a, it, like a joke that had gone horribly rogue. So like a few of us were joking about like, wouldn't it be weird if we could find the Tron guy and the goatee man and put them in a room together? What would that be like? Let's do it, because we're Harvard students and we can. And so like, that was literally like the plan, right? And we put up a website thinking that nobody was gonna be interested and all of a sudden money started coming in. And we had like cash in an envelope under Tim's bed, and it was just <laughs> shit got really real. Um, and to make it even weirder, we reached out to Tron guy, uh, and he immediately was like, "I'm in. Where do I go? Like, where's like when's this happening?" Um, so we picked the date of the first conference based on when Tron guy could make it. Um, and then aside from that, we had no other logistics in place. Like, we didn't have a venue, we didn't have any money, we didn't know like how we were gonna get other speakers here. And at that point, we still really thought it was gonna be like, you know, 40 of our friends in a room in a basement somewhere, not unlike this. 
Um, and <laughs> what ended circle. up happening was like uh, it, it grew and grew. More and more people were interested in it, and we realized we really had something on our hands. None of us had ever planned a conference before, um, so we all just kind of winged it until uh, the first the first RaffleCon happened in 2008. And I think there were, we told the fire department 600 people, which meant it was really like 650, 700 um, at MIT. And yeah, it was, it was this incredibly bizarre place where basically imagine this, this is like a really good benchmark for like about what RafaCon is. Imagine this conference, but with way more like people that you recognize from the internet, just wandering around amidst the academics and talking <laughs> with the academics and everyone kind of being like, whoa, I didn't know this could happen in real life. Yeah, um, th that's great. Yeah, because I remember when we, when we interviewed you, you, you described it as both, you called it Raffle Khan, and I think we asked, well, is it the Khan convention or is it conference? And you're like, well, it's both. Uh, and because you wanted to have this weird intersection of kind of academic and practitioner, and that was something that I think that Laura and I tried very much to model in the issue itself was like, I want Nick Douglas being forever cited for like producing the internet ugly aesthetic, right? In every academic article forthcoming. Um, could you talk some about like what your motivations were behind trying to do this kind of crossover event? Sure, um, most of it was actually pretty natural. Like I think I actually spent a lot of time thinking about it being here um, is that we thought we were putting together an academic conference, but we were undergrads and internet studies was not a thing. So we didn't actually know what academic conferences were supposed to be like. Like we knew they involved <laughs> panels, but like the idea of reading a paper seemed preposterous. So we um, just found like, we, we basically put together the thing that we wanted to make. And that, um, and I, I think part of it was like, to, to describe too much motivation behind the initial uh, thought seems a little bit weird in retrospect, but I think um, we were going to these academic-ish conferences uh, where there were a lot of internet theorists talking about the internet, and at the time, it's like 2007, 2008, right? Um, it was a lot of like old people being like, these kids these days are doing this on the internet, and have you heard of the 4chan? And it was like really, really alienating to be somebody from that community to go there and be like, that's not actually, ooh, like that's not what happens. Um, so part of the motivation for us, I think, was like trying to highlight the voices that we felt represented our culture and our community. Um, and so part of that was literally just finding like as many internet celebrities from our youth as we could. And it was a part of this game, like could you track down the guy who made that video from that you saw when you were 13? Um, but part of it was that we were really curious to hear what they had to say because at that time there was no Buzzfeed, there was no like New York Times best-selling books by people who had blogs, you know, like it was, it was a different time. Um, and nobody knew that these people like really existed or were people, so. Uh, one of the things that RaffleCon really did was kind of prove to the internet that the internet was full of people, right? There was this like reflecting pool moment that happened. Um, but it, I know that in the history of the conference, it happened and kind of had, that took very different forms every year. And I'm wondering how you might compare kind of where you were, because it's also the same moment that like internet celebrity is kind of breaching the horizon. And so w where was that when you began versus kind of where you sort of left RaffleCon? Sure. Um, so in 2008 when we started, um, like I said, it was, it was really about like, let's find the people who made these artifacts that we really uh, you know, were familiar with from growing up on a very particular part of the internet. And so it was like, Homestar Runner, who are the people behind it? Let's go find them and like bring them here. Like, you know, the Leroy Jenkins, who is that guy, right? Like, let's find him and bring him. <laughs> I literally uh, stopped, like, I, <laughs> we're friends now, but I, um, I, I think I called his work and was like, um, is there somebody named Ben Schultz who works here? And then afterwards I told him and he was slight, vaguely horrified that I had done that understandably. Um, so in, in 2008, it was really like, we almost didn't know who the people were behind these things. It was more about like the, the things that they had created. And in 2010, it, it um, already had become more of a like internet personality thing, right? There were people who were well known online for being weird people online. Um, and then 2012, which is the last time we did the conference, something really bizarre had happened, which was that 
being a personality on the internet had turned into a business. Um, and uh, we went from talking to people who were basically shocked that we wanted to talk to them in 2008 to 2012, like some significant number of our guests had agents, um, including cats. Cats had agents in 2012. And so there was a very, very different world where um, internet fame and internet culture had become a, a profession and an industry, a small one, but um, one that was kind of rapidly growing. Um, how has, I guess, sort of getting to, to, to meet one of the internets face to face um, uh, shaped your thinking about, uh, how would I put it, like the, I guess that tension between kind of the individual and the mass, right, where, where you, like these are, <clears throat> there's a number of anecdotes of all sorts of strange things that are kind of out, like byproducts of the phenomenon of internet celebrity or the way the internet can like pluck someone out of anonymity and like turn them into something. Um, and there are always kind of human stakes that are underpinning all of those. And I know that those have come up in some of the Rafflecons. So I was just kind of wanting you to sort of, yeah, just, I think you have some thoughts about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I guess like what I was really fascinated by, you know, like my experience in 2008 as one of the organizers was more just this surreal like, oh wow, I can't believe these people are people experience. Um, but as I met more and more of the people that we invited to come, um, you know, a lot of them had been, had become famous in a kind of mm, like not, not, harassed in the way that people get harassed now, um, but certainly not, they weren't famous because they were like real cool, right? Like they were famous as part of, you know, the internet ugly aesthetic, which is not a great thing to have happen to you. Um, and even outside of that, there were a lot of people who became famous unintentionally. And that was kind of one of the recurring themes of the conference was trying to get uh, at those, those people to tell their stories of what it's like to have the internet kind of pick you out of nowhere and turn you into an image that is everywhere all of a sudden. Um, so we heard this story from, uh, from kids like Success Kid and David After Dentist all the way to you know, people who had been really, really humiliated um, like uh, Alexi Vayner um, who made that Impossible is Nothing video resume. Um, and it was really interesting because as organizers, one of the things we were most conscientious of was like, we don't want people to feel harassed at our conference, right? We don't want them to feel humiliated. Um, so we were trying to be conscientious of that, but what was shocking to us was that we, you know, we didn't put any active measures into place that was like, hey, don't make fun of people because that never works. But like the people were actually really, really civil as soon as they sort of heard the human side of the story. And so I think looking back, that's one of the things I'm most proud of is that, you know, the, as the internet turned people into these symbols and memes that get circulated around without context, um, it, this was a place that could kind of help reinflate them back into human beings. Um, is, is there any place where that can like happen now? I mean, I, I, the, your language of, um, oh, people weren't getting harassed the way they were harassed now. And I'm like, well, what's happened to harassment, right? Like, like what, what has it turned into in these kind of post rafflecon years? Um, is there a way that you would like maybe give a shape to that? Or, or has it, do you think it has a different texture to it? And is there a way of like rebooting that sense of maybe like interpersonal accountability? I mean, I mean we can't solve the internet, but you know, I'm just curious about what you think. Um, I think that, well, for one, it, people have gotten better at, rep at creating digital selves for themselves, right? So like back in the, the period of internet culture that I was really interested in when we were making RaffleCon was really that like 90s, early 2000s, GeoCities kind of glitchy hackers look, right? Um, and back then the internet and having a presence on the internet was not available to everyone. Increasingly it is, um, and I think that has a good side and a bad side. The good side is that it's easier than ever for people to tell their own side of the story. The bad side is that it's easier to find where you live online. And I, uh, to me, that's what really feels like has changed with harassment from, in 2008, it was like people would make fun of the one vid, like picture that you put on GeoCities, but they couldn't break into your digital home in the form of your Twitter feed or your uh, Facebook page or whatever and leave like nasty, nasty you know, replies, right? They couldn't find your friends like, because the, your digital self and your real self were still very, very disconnected. 
Um, increasingly, that's not the case. And so I, I think that's really the, the main way that harassment has changed. But I think like in the years since, there's, you know, the media is now paying attention to these stories more, right? We see people getting profiled um, all over the place in, in all kinds of uh, publications and on the news, and people are interested in these stories in and of themselves. Um, so in that way, like what we were doing no longer has to happen at a conference like ours. Right. And I think uh, that's a great place to open it up to general questions from the audience. Does this get past here? Um, if so, if you have a question, if you could come up so that the live stream can hear you, the live stream mic is up here. So one of the questions from the live uh, tweeting uh, was for Jason, but I think it could open up to all of you. And I want to invite Patrick or An, who also contributed to this issue, if you have any insight you'd like to share. Um, so someone asked whether reaction gifts or whether you've seen reaction gifts functioning in cultures outside the United States or across language. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would actually I actually wanted to ask Anne about about this. Uh, do you, have, do you have something to say about this? Yeah? Awesome. Great. Anne's going to come up. Everyone welcome Anne. <laughs> um, the brief answer is I've seen it in Spanish, in Spanish language uh, cultures, but I think Anne probably had a lot more insight. Okay, thanks. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, yes, so I, I, um, I presented a paper, uh, not presented, but published a paper with the, with the same journal. And um, um, I think reaction gifts in other cultures um, often have um, you know, the same role. And I think what really resonated with me with uh, Jason's talk is this notion of gesture. Um, and that these reaction gifts pr perform um, this, the same kind of space that um, in, in, uh, in, in uh, physical culture might, might be like nonverbal gestures. And, um, and what I've looked at specifically is um, in China and in political and activist contexts, how that can be a really effective way of evading censorship. That um, if, uh, especially with the research that I was doing in 2011, 2012, if, uh, if, the, if the censorship is based on word searches and um, algorithms about um, your network, um, um, engaging in gifts and in nonverbal expression can be a really important way of, of expressing your political beliefs or your, of your, or your actions. And so, um, so you see all kinds of gifts that are remixing, um, remixing like leaders of, uh, of, the, of the party or remixing um, activists, and, and those images serve an important role. And as image search um, gets stronger, um, it's, it's more and more difficult to do. Um, but certainly, um, it's, it has um, has different impacts in them, um, and I can speak to um, a little bit to uh, to Uganda um, and the Ugandan context. Is um, is again, is uh, you see you see a similar sort of action where um, where the image or the GIF has this kind of nonverbal form of expression, and it's it's particularly um, powerful when you look at cultures that are um, that are oral cultures um, and cultures where the written word um, is hasn't been like formalized or standardized um, in in like Roman letters, um, and so um, so cultures that have traditionally been oral. Um, can often lean on these um, these forms of nonverbal expression as as filling in the gaps that are so important to that culture that um, that um, the written word doesn't really allow for. Um, I've also seen them in China, and I think like one of the fascinating things is the um, the. You, you, there's a combination, weird combination of both of your talks. Like there are these profoundly internet ugly uh, gifs that are actually used more like. Uh, Hallmark cards almost, like they're made specifically for certain occasions and they're, they're sent around on WeChat as like occasion markers. Um, so that's a very different type of reaction GIF in a lot of ways. Um, I know they're also very popular in Brazil. And one of the coolest things about a GIF is that because it's lacking in like, you don't necessarily have to have any words that go with it, they can actually be quite universal and I've seen the same ones go from culture to culture online. Are there any other questions? Um, so I had a question um, about the, sh the shit aesthetic of the pictures. Um, I came in a little bit late, so I apologize for going over something that you said already. But I was wondering um, how the structure of like the apps that are used for image sharing, um, in particular, on like sites like Instagram or whatever, um, sort of hinge on like the idea of original content as ideal, and um, so screenshots are necessary. Um, but also, I was wondering like it also has this minimal and austere sort of interface. So I was wondering, so they stand out a lot more. And I was wondering if you think that that's a conscious sort of rejection or um, if it's just a reaction. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I think like a, a huge thing is actually around what is the business model of whoever is owns the platform because usually these things are for profit. Um, and so you'll see on Instagram there's right there's a, a lot of interest in keeping people sharing their own personal stuff. And uh, Instagram, I would uh, I'm really guessing with this, but I would think that their concentration is very much on making sure pe people are sharing personal stories and not copying things from elsewhere. So that's why they don't make it particularly easy uh, to copy something over versus, say, Tumblr, uh, which has an interest in getting people to share bits of what they found over the web. Um, obviously, um, you see people using these tools in the ways they weren't theoretically intended to be, um, and most of the time, these tools eventually evolve to match up with the actual user behavior, so long as that behavior isn't too destructive to the goal uh, of the platform. Uh, you ob obviously see that with Twitter. Almost every important feature there, the hashtag, the retweet, began as something manual to force it to do something it wasn't supposed to do, um, and then eventually became a baked-in feature. Um, contrast all this with Imager, which is very interested in helping people just copy something they saw somewhere. Imager, as the reason I uh, ended up noticing any of these trends was because for years I've worked in uh, online comedy and meme uh, analysis and uh, reporting and, and making up advice animals for a living, which was very weird and turned me into an Imager hater because people would just grab whole galleries throw them on there, post them to Reddit. And often these people had decent reasons for thinking it was a good idea to do so. Um, but just some platform existed that made it very easy to steal in a certain way, and there wasn't really a great motivation for Imager to fix that. It wasn't really a problem for them. Uh, it was only a problem for the people whose stuff was getting stolen. And then that does make people evolve in their actual expression. Um, we started moving away from doing more image posts and doing more video stuff just because the tools for video don't happen to reward um, grabbing something and copying it over. So we've heard a lot of the lessons for yesterday and today about the forms that are really empowering, right? Like the selfie is very empowering. And, um, even in this, in this panel, right, about the cons, Sort of empowering for these, these online personalities and kind of the gift of sort of universality of it. Um, but I'm really interested in sort of the shit that's said it because it seems to be breaking down, or it seems to be kind of knocking people down. Um, but I'm wondering if I'm not, if I'm missing right where there might be sort of an opportunity for empowerment for the individual in the shit that's said it. Um, sure. um. Well, I think like a lot of the time, it's not necessarily about knocking someone else down. Um, I really think it's a way to mock yourself. Uh, like I saw with the nailed it uh, motif, I thought it was a lot of saying, we're all in this together, we're all uh, not achieving these other ideals that have been set up. I, th I think there's really actually a great empowering message in that. Um, I think Tumblr has also used that to a good extent um, to take someone else's image, add their own thing below it, um, whether built into the, uh, the same image or whether just on a reblog with an added picture, they'll start like taking something that takes itself very seriously and then um, undercut it with their comments. Uh, but they do so, I think, in a way that is, I, gu I guess at, at some point I'd have to attribute it to actually like the user base, that like there are places that will use this aesthetic to knock other people down and shit on other people. Uh, and there are places like Tumblr that are much more frequently going to just take the piss out of someone self-important, um, are gonna do more uh, punching up uh, with that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's definitely a way to critique self-seriousness by like, you know, drawing a mustache on the Mona Lisa. But so frequently it's people drawing a mustache on a selfie is really the thing. Um, most recently in me using communities was that idea of the rare meme, which I'll be like, like self-aware, they know it's, it's absurd, so they're going to be rare, but the other questions of maybe the meme using communities know that they are a community that's defined by its little forces or its little kind of uh, groups as this thing, and they're, um, they're showing self-awareness in kind of new ways. I was wondering if anyone on the panel might join the course of your research, what you've noticed about the development of self-awareness or weaknessivity, cultural weaknessivity. Thank you. 
Um, I would actually po posit almost the opposite. It's like there are no more meme creating communities because that is just a community. Like it, at the point in time in which my mom sends me more animated gifs on WeChat than like anybody, um, you know, every community has their own memes. And the, we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but one of the core tensions within RaffleCon was like, we started off really believing there was this meme community and this internet culture that was somehow separate from everything else. Um, and both as a natural progression of the way the internet just expanded um, and as like me realizing more things as I grew older than 19 years old um, was this realization that you know every the internet now has eaten everything or most everything as Anz talk, talked about um, and all of these communities are are using memes as a tool and using internet culture as a tool for spreading their own conversations and, and messages. So if you look at any, literally any community online now, there are their own image macros, there are their own reaction gifts, there are their own shit aesthetic, <laughs> you know, things. So it's, it's really, it's the opposite. It's, it's exploded and it no longer exists now. I just wanted to add one thing to that, which is um, w one thing that was in tension, in tension with um, the, the goal of, of the exhibit that I ended up organizing, um, is this idea that um, uh, having a novel reaction GIF has a lot of currency. Um, and, um, and, and while certainly there's some that have been canonized, like the ones that we looked at I think are, are uh, appropriate examples of those, um, there is this sort of constant beast that needs to be fed um, where um, you really sort of do get some sort of social currency out, out of having like sort of that perfect gift that no one's seen before and sort of using it in, in, the, in the right way. And there's even actually a subreddit called retired, retired gifts, I think. Um, whenever someone has used it perfectly, then it's sort of posted there in memoriam. I think in some ways it's also kind of like um, when you go to a party, you know, there are two kinds of DJs. There are DJs who play weddings and there are DJs who are like artists, right? And there's a time and place for both of those things. If you are an artist DJ at a wedding, like, and you play a song that no one's ever heard before, no one's going to dance. And if the point of your music is to try to make people dance, then you have failed. And so I think, like, there's definitely a corner of the internet where you want to create these new gifs, but, um, I switch. Um, <laughs> but, um, also, like, if the point is to try to get people to understand the degree of the Oprah unknown you're trying to convey to them, you have to use the Oprah unknown. Um, I'm part of a Facebook group called Post Aesthetics that um, really emphasizes like uh, new memes, but also is very self-aware. And each post is about an aesthetic. Uh, so if you propose an aesthetic and the colon and what your aesthetic is. And generally with a meme, usually of your own creation, uh, post C is really important. So I'm curious, you mentioned the uh, Lucas uh, rebrand, the grid lines from Instagram. I'm curious how authenticity uh, like plays in this realm, especially in this group. Like you can add artifacts to create a message, but I imagine that over time, inauthentic posts will become sort of flat. I don't know. I'm curious. Shit, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely like a feel that that a feeling that uh, adding shit that that degrades image sort of does make it more authentic, actually. Like. But by saying, uh, I, I think there's actually an advantage to not like copying something directly over, um, and that there's more uproar when you see someone uh, getting caught just plagiarizing tweets or something else that they can make an actually actually perfect copy from uh, than when nobody expected that anyway. That they're at least like, oh, this is how I'm living, just like putting other people's shit on my site. Um, I think there's like almost a pride to that, just a little bit of aesthetic. Um, I also, by the way, would recommend uh, the 1200 Rare Pepe's meme, which is a 4 chance reaction to the, the, the like, uh, changing um, nature of the memes, that, that, that now memes are just everyone's. And so I think it's the most appropriate reaction they've had yet. They've had very appropriate reactions before. The hot topic decided to put the Ray Chase on uh, t-shirts. They uh, decided to turn him into a racist character, because uh, that would scare Hot Topic away. Uh, in the end, it did not work. Hot Topic did end up, uh, after taking and putting them back up being like, you can't troll us. And now the rare Pepe's, they've done much more self-mocking, saying like, we're gonna make rare memes, but in a way that clearly shows that they understand things are different now. 
we need to find a special little thing to open their club gets to do. We have time for one final question. Or not. Do we you want to make it rain journal issues? Yes. So in addition to this in addition to all the all the papers you saw today and many more uh, being available for free online. They're also available free in person, uh, thanks to Lane. So, <laughs> so please feel free to come up and grab them. Um, and thank you for, for attending.